Let's remember who Jesus is together. He's the lion who's so powerful, um, who defeats all our enemies, but he's the lamb who sacrificed himself for our sins. Nothing can stop you, Lord Jesus. Nothing can stop you going to the cross. Lord, not Peter listening to the devil saying, Lord, don't sacrifice yourself. Lord, nothing can stop you. And we thank you, Jesus. The devil couldn't stop you saying these people are not worth dying for. 
Lord, you loved us. You still do. You lay down your life like that lamb. Lord, silent, willing to die for our sins. And yet, Lord, you rose like that lion. Lord, roaring out great victory. Lord, you've beaten death. You've beaten all the powers of hell. You've beaten sin. Lord, and you breathe your life now on anyone who trusts in you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. We're going to carry on singing in this. Let's just make this our prayer this morning. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you. As we listen to your word today, you would speak. Please give us listening hearts and ears for your glory's sake. Amen. Okay, Jenny's going to come and bring today's reading. Thank you. reading today in the church Bibles is on page 772, titled um, The Fellowship of Believers, verses 42 to the end of the chapter. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. 
all the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. Okay, let's pray again before we look at that together. Father, please talk to us about Jesus in the power of your Spirit. Lord, we just ask that you would help us this morning. Lord, what we've read is something that happened and something we can't force to happen again, but something we long to happen again. And Lord, we just ask you would help us as a church, Lord, to be the people you've made us to be. And Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't know Jesus as their saviour, please speak to them now, we pray. Amen. I think um, part of the reason we chose graduation today uh, was because... This passage goes amazingly with um, what's, what's happened, these youngsters coming in to join us. Uh, it's an incredible thing that happens here, isn't it? I'm sure it's a familiar part of the Bible to lots of us. Um, but just a quick recap, the church in Acts take up Jesus' baton. He's handing it on, go and make disciples of the whole world. Big task, isn't it? Big mission, big baton, the whole world. And I will be with you. How's he with us when we can't see him? The Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, having the Holy Spirit is exactly like having him living in our hearts and the Father too. So full of the fullness of God. And we saw, first of all, as the church took up the baton in Acts, they needed power, didn't they? Power to be witnesses. We saw that. Last week, we saw they needed vision to see what Jesus was doing, that he was opening up the whole world like a big harvest time and that anyone who trusts in him will be saved. He's reversing the curse of Babel because we can join around Jesus. It's the only place where all of humanity, all of mankind can join successfully and it works around Jesus, around the cross. And this week we're, we're moving on to so the part Jenny read. What happened next was this. Devotion. They devoted themselves. Now we all, I think we all know what that looks like, don't we? If we see someone who's devoted, we see someone who's maybe sacrificed something to be with somebody else. They've given up something to join themselves because they love that person more than that other thing, isn't it? And they devoted, you can say they're loyal, wholehearted, they're just 100%, they've given themselves 100% to that person or to that thing, whatever it is. We all know what it looks like. And it was such a different life that these Christians, this church, were living compared to the world around them. It was an amazing life, wasn't it? What Jenny read, you're like, wow. And everyone sort of looks up to that time in Acts. They're like, if only it could be like that today. That would be so amazing. They knew tastes of heaven on earth, isn't it? As, as a church meeting together, they were united. They shared all their stuff. If some of the richer members sold what they had to provide for the poor, so there was no one who was poor, no one who was extremely rich. They shared everything. They ate in each other's houses. The church was growing. A taste of heaven on earth. Such a different life to the world around. They devoted themselves. But there has been loads of confusion about this part of the Bible. I've heard of people who see what's written 
and then say, I have to try and live like that, like it's a command. So in other words, I'm not allowed to have any stuff. I feel guilty about owning anything, and I'll try and sell it all, and I'll try and copy what happened here, and I'm not allowed to sort of own anything. Or, and I've actually seen this, someone saying, this means I can walk into your house and just start using your stuff, making myself a coffee, taking your stuff without me even asking. Because we're brothers, aren't we? We love each other. So people sort of take this almost as a prescription, if that makes sense, that this is what Jesus is telling us we should do, commanding us to do, But it's not, first of all, that. It's a description. In other words, it's saying, this is what happened. But let me come back again. All through the Bible, Jesus does prescribe that we live like this. So I know it's a bit confusing to start with. He does say we should commit ourselves to a church, if we're a Christian, and be a member, and celebrate communion, and come and pray together, and eat in each other's homes, and, and make sure we're joining morning and evening on a Sunday. All those things he, he, he does command us to do. But this, the devotion that's meant to lead to us doing these things can't be taught, if that makes sense. I can tell you to do it, but you won't do it unless something happens. So Jesus does command us as a church to do these things, but I don't want us to lose the heart of why they did it. That's what I'm on about this morning. So we could just do it, couldn't we, out of duty? Or we could get all confused and I could, right, I'm coming into your house, I'm going to take your coffee, or I'll feel guilty about owning anything and I'll sell everything. We could do all that, we could sort of force it, but that's not what happened here. They devoted themselves as a result of something else. that They devoted themselves because of something amazing that had touched their hearts, their souls, their very lives, their minds. They'd completely changed as people. So this can't be taught, but it is something we need to ask Jesus to help us to have so that we will go on to do the things he wants us to do. Why did they devote themselves? Why did they say we are committing ourselves to each other? Why were they eating in each other's homes? Why did they devote themselves to church life? Why did they devote themselves to breaking bread and prayer and fellowship? All these amazing things. Why did that happen? Well, last week we talked about the wonders of God, didn't we? They all didn't just hear the wonders of God in their own language. They experienced the wonders of God. They tasted the wonders of God. They felt the wonders of God. What are all those things? Everything that Jesus brings to us, that God gives to us through Jesus, forgiveness for all our sins. That's wonderful, isn't it? To know every morning you wake up, I'm forgiven for the past. I'm not condemned anymore by what I've done and said in the past. It's gone. It's been taken away. I'm clean. Jesus cleans me by his blood. That's That's one of the wonders of God, isn't it? I can walk around with a clean conscience when I come to him and he cleans me up. I'm loved wherever I go. That's wonderful, isn't it? The wonders of God. I'm loved, infinitely and unconditionally loved. No matter who I am, what I've done, God loves me and I know it because Jesus has died and sacrificed himself on the cross for me. And all of this, many, many more things, isn't it? All the wonders of God, the very life and love and light of God have come into their hearts and souls and minds by the power of the Spirit and totally changed them. Now they have God's forgiveness. Now they have God's help. Now they have God's comfort. Now they know God's life. Now they know God's power, God's love and light and guidance and everything they need. And it's incredible. And because of Jesus working in them on that great day, they started loving God for the first time in their lives and and each other. They got stirred up in their hearts by the Holy Spirit. They were moved to do it. And because they were so moved by all the wonderful things that God had done through Jesus and the power of his Spirit for them, they devoted themselves. That's where it came from. 
So we could, couldn't we? We could sort of put church rules in and try and enforce and try to say this, you've got it, and this and that. But much better, isn't it? All of them, it's like a spontaneous thing. No one told them to do it. But because of the amazing things Jesus had done in their hearts, they were moved to do it. They were like, I want to do this. I want to devote myself to the apostles' teaching. I want to devote myself to the fellowship. I want to devote myself to breaking bread. I want to give myself because, well, we're going to look at, so we're going to, we are going to look at what each one is in order that Jesus would hopefully stir us up as a church. But that's ultimately what we want this morning, isn't it? We are looking at devotion, but to have that devotion, we need Jesus to stir it up in us and to give us that help. So what do they give themselves to? What do they devote themselves to? The first one was the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching. What is that? Not stuff that you need a degree to be able to understand, or a master's or a doctorate, not sort of like the apostles didn't grab this massive dusty book off the shelf that then, and everyone sort of chokes on the dust, and then they start reading in sort of old-fashioned language and, and too complicated for anyone to understand. It wasn't dry, like teaching, you know, I know some of you in school might say, oh, I really struggle with my teacher because what they do, they don't really even love what they're teaching. It comes across a bit dry, it's a bit boring, it's a bit lifeless, it's a bit cold. Was it that? No, it wasn't that. It was doctrine, it was things to believe, but not how some people treat doctrine. I think Wayne Grudem, he's written a big book called Systematic Theology. Okay, and it might, if you have a copy, it might be gathering dust on your... But it, it is because it's like a reference book. So he's gone through the Bible, and what he's done is he said, right, let's take God the Father. So he'll have a chapter on God the Father. So what I'll do is pull out all the verses where God is spoken about as a father in the Bible and go through what, it, what that teaches us. But do you know what he has at the end of every chapter? A song. That's different, isn't it? So you open this big book, this big doctrine book, but he says at the start, the reason I've put a song at the end of every chapter is because if you understand what the Bible is saying, if you get it, by the end of the chapter, you'll want to sing. That's what it should be. And see, so he's always put, sort of not put that guilt trip on you, he's like, well, I hope I understand it, I hope I do sing. And the songs he cho chooses at the end of the chapter are often so great. So you might have something like God the Father. It's not just boring, dry facts, is it? What he, what he has, says is God the Father. What it means is he's always been a father, always been the father of Jesus. He knows how to love. He knows how to provide. He knows how to care. And the amazing thing is, as a father, he's willing to adopt you into his family. And you can call him your father just like Jesus does. That's a tiny little bit of what he says. Doesn't that make you want to sing? I can't remember the song he puts at the end of that chapter. Maybe I should have looked it up. But when, you, when that sinks in, isn't it? Real teaching, real preaching should make us want to sing, isn't it? I'm loved. I'm cared for. I have a Father in heaven who can provide everything I need. So the apostles' teaching, that's what it was. What was it about? Well, I think it summed up really well. Have a look at verse 22. This is Peter. And he stands up and he says, men of Israel, listen to this. So he says, as an apostle, I'm about to give you some teaching. What is his teaching about? Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth. That's where he starts his teaching. Now that's incredible, isn't it? You can sum up the Bible's teaching. In fact, Jesus said... Moses wrote about me. First five books, they're about Jesus. Jesus says, doesn't he, he goes through the whole Bible in Luke 24 with those two disciples who are down and depressed. And he says that he shows them all in all the whole Bible, every passage that's about him. And that's what Peter says. He says, this is where we're going to start. This is where we're going to carry on. This is where we're going to finish. Let me tell you, my teaching is this, Jesus Jesus of Nazareth. Listen to him. Listen about him. Why Jesus? Why not sort of, uh, let's just sort of 
talk about God first and try and imagine what he might be like? Well, because we don't need to. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And he is everything God is in the flesh, if you like. So you look at Jesus, Jesus says that, doesn't he? Show us the Father. And Jesus says, you've seen him. If you've seen me, you've seen everything. You've seen the Father loves. You've seen the Father's merciful. You've seen he's forgiving and compassionate and he's just. And he, he does get angry, but he's really slow to get angry. He doesn't like judging, but he will if it is necessary. And, and Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen him. That's why Jesus is at the center of everything we do as a church. Jesus is our hope, isn't he? He is our forgiveness. He is our righteousness. He is our savior. He's our prince of peace. He's the one who's paid with his own blood for our sins. He's the one who all of God's blessings come through. God the Father always shows, isn't he? When he says, this is my son. When he's baptized, when Jesus is baptized, listen to him, I love him. So we're not talking dry stuff, high intellectual stuff. We're talking Jesus. And no wonder they, they devoted themselves to that teaching, isn't it? Because they're like, well, we know Jesus. We've just got to know him for the first time. We've just heard his voice. We've just known his forgiveness. He's our savior. No wonder they devoted that. They were like, we, we need to devote ourselves to this teaching. Every opportunity we get to listen to the apostles' teaching and to open our Bibles together, we're going to be there. Morning, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, prayer meeting, men's, men's meeting, ladies' meeting, whatever it might be. We, if we can, we're going to be there because they know it's another chance to get to know Jesus better. That's what this morning is, isn't it? Listen to this. This is basically every single one of my sermons and Brian's sermons is basically people of Bethel, listen to this, Jesus. If you want to sum up every sermon, isn't it? Is that all you've got to say? That's all we've got to say, but in Jesus, isn't it, is packed everything that God is. And as we unpack it, you get to understand who God is. You get to know him better. You get to know the help of his spirit. That's why it's Jesus. There's a difference, isn't there, between being told about somebody and meeting that person for yourself. A few years ago, we played football as, as, as a church. Clive will remember. I think he, he played um, and others. We played against my old church in Swansea. I can't remember if Brian actually, did you play in that match? I think Brian played against us, but we won't mention that. <laughs> he switched teams. He switched teams. But to try and scare us, they said this. We've got a guy who used to play for FC Porto. Now, if you know, they're a team that plays in Europe. They're a good team. He's an ex-professional. We had Christian. I know Christian was injured, wasn't he? He sort of kicked a ball, and then his ankle, poor Christian, his ankle would sort of give him loads of pain. They were like, we've got a guy from FC Porto. And, you know, you started to think, oh, man, I've only just been jogging for a few weeks to sort of try and get fit for this match. I'm nowhere near as fit as I used to be. How are we going to compete against him? And we kept hearing story after story about this guy playing in Europe, playing against some of the best players in the world, and he played for FC Porto, and he was warming up on the touchline, and we were like, oh, he's just going to run circles around us. That was the facts we were told about him. The good news was he'd lost all his fitness, wasn't used to playing real football where your passes don't quite get to you, so you have to run like three miles extra per match, and where you have to work really hard in the mud and in the, in the weather down Sully, which is always like the middle of winter, isn't it, on that pitch? The wind howls against you, and you kick the ball in the air, and it comes back to you rather than being passed to play. That's how strong the wind is. Fortunately for us, he wasn't the player he used to be. What we'd been told and what we actually saw, even though it was a disappointment for him not to be like that, it was a relief to us, it was two very different things. We hear about Jesus every Sunday, don't we, and in RBT, every time we get together. But let me tell you, it will never be a disappointment when you see him and when you meet him. And that's the aim of every sermon, isn't it? Not just you'll hear stuff, you'll hear facts, you'll hear things, 
And not just that you get your hopes up to think, oh, this guy sounds amazing. He's God in the flesh. He's died for me. He loves me. But then when you meet him, you're like, oh, he's not the person I thought he was. No, never. He's even better than you get told. He's better than me and Brian could ever describe him. Because when you taste Jesus' life, when you devote yourself to the apostles' teaching, it's not just opening a book and learning facts. That The Spirit of God breathes his life, doesn't he? This is a living book, a living word. And you actually meet Jesus through it, and you're like, he's far better than I ever dreamed or imagined. He loves me way more than I thought. He, he never has a bad day in a match. He always wins. He always succeeds. He never runs out of energy or endurance or stamina or forgiveness or help or mercy. He's way better in person. And that's what we long for, isn't it? And when you see that, doesn't that make you want to think, oh, I, I need to devote myself? And if you find our sermons boring, remember Christian's testimony, isn't it? He was brutally honest when he came to Bethel. He said, I'm going to give it one more Sunday with Carla, and if nothing happens, I'm going. And nothing happened, and he went. And do you remember we were all worried, and we didn't see them for ages? And then he came back a couple of months after, and he said to me and Merv, is someone, is someone giving you preaching lessons? It's very uh, <laughs> brutal, isn't it? But what he said was, now it all makes sense. See, there was nothing there before. It was just boring. If you think our sermons are boring, pray for me and Brian. Pray that Jesus would speak to you through them. And if you're seeking him through them, he will speak to you. And it's like, for want of a better phrase, it might change from hearing nothing to like someone's given us preaching lessons because what's happening now Jesus is speaking to you we need to devote ourselves to the apostles teaching next one the fellowship this does mean becoming a church member but it's more than that when we use the word fellowship isn't it we're talking about friendship companionship family life so more than one person Friendship, and there's one friendship, there's one fellowship that's better than any other friendship, any other fellowship, and it's the one that's been going on forever. It's the friendship, the fellowship that the Bible loves to speak of, a Father, Son, and Spirit. One God, three persons there, share the Father and Jesus eternally sharing the love and fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit. Forgive me, it's hard to explain, is it? Hard to understand. But that's how the Bible, that's how God presents himself. And Jesus says things like this. Every day I, was, I delighted in your presence. He looks at the Father and he says, like, I just love being with my Father. I love being devoted to him. I love being in his presence. I delight. I can't wait to hear what he has to say. I love being with him. And as he pours out the Spirit, as he gives that life and love and shares it all with me and I carry out his work, I love it. And the father looks on his son and he says, this is my son whom I love. What a fellowship, isn't it? What a friendship that can't be broken. What a thrill. And you, and you look on, have you ever been jealous of someone else's friendship? Maybe in school, isn't it? You feel left out. You're like, I wish, wish I could be part of that group. Wish I could be part, I wish I could be friends with them. They're all popular. Look how they laugh. Look how they have such a good time. I just don't feel like I belong anywhere. I need fellowship. I need that friendship. What a friendship to hold up, isn't it? Father, Son, and Spirit, eternally friends, eternally in this unbreakable, loving fellowship full of light and love and acceptance and everything. Well, the amazing thing is, the day you trusted in Jesus, you were taken in to that fellowship. Isn't that an amazing thought? You are friends with them. You're friends with God. Remember Abraham? He was called a friend of God. You're like, I wish I could be part of that group. I wish I could be part of their life. The amazing thing is, if you are a Christian, if you trust in Jesus, you already are. It doesn't matter who else sort of looks at you and says, oh, I don't want you, I'm not talking to you. Jesus has always got time for you. And you are part of that amazing fellowship already. 1 John 1, 3 says this, We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, 
Jesus Christ. He says, we tell others about Jesus so they can have fellowship with us. But really, where is that fellowship? It is with us, but it's, it's much better. It's with God himself, with the Father, with his son, Jesus. And as we meet together, his spirit helps us to cry, isn't it? Abba, Father, Father in heaven. It's so amazing to be sharing his life and his love and his light. That's who we are as Christians. I read an amazing thing. A uh, good Scottish preacher, Alistair Begg, read, uh, he, as he preached on this, this is what I read. Before, before we do it, sometimes we're tempted, aren't we, to be in church, like, oh, no one's the same as me. No one understands me. No one's my age. I think particularly the younger ones get a bit trapped in that, isn't it? What you mean is there's no one who was born on exactly the same day, exactly the same second as me, therefore I can't have anything to do with them. And they wouldn't want to know me anyway because they're really popular and I'm not. And we get all grumpy, don't we, sometimes? I'm the oldest one. I'm the youngest one. I'm the middlest one. I'm, I'm the poorest one. I'm the one who hasn't got it all together. Listen to this. He said, there's an 80-year-old in church, and they're sat there on a chair on Sunday morning. And there's a 17-year-old in church, sat on the other side of the church building. He said, through the preaching, through the apostles' teaching, that 17-year-old needs to realize they have more in common with that 80-year-old than they do when they're stood with their peers in college, with their mates, laughing on their phones, on social media, whatever, feeling this is where I really belong. He says, no, you have more to do with that 80-year-old in church and the other way around. Why? Because there is something stronger that joins you together in fellowship than just natural friends or even family. It's Jesus, isn't it? Jesus, that fellowship. And, and we're like, wow, what a thrill it is to be a Christian, isn't it? So he's saying that 17-year-old, when they get this, when they understand, as they sit together with the 30s, the 40-year-olds, the 50-year-olds, 60-year-olds, 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds, 90-year-olds, we've had someone 104, so we have to go up that high. Maybe we'll have someone older in the future. 104, the oldest member of Bethel at one stage. Or when they get it, when they understand, when they join with them in church, They are sharing fellowship and friendship with them. They have the Holy Spirit. They're sharing in the life of Jesus as they speak to that church member. It's not just a normal conversation. It's not just a normal friendship. It's not just chatting about social media. It's not just laughing. There is joy and there is excitement. There's a thrill because as you get together, you are sharing in the very life of God himself, of Jesus in the power of his spirit. And it goes on forever. And that friendship will never be broken. You'll never be cast away, Jesus says. You'll never be unwelcome. You'll never be told you're not pretty enough. You're not popular enough. You're not rich enough. Everyone, Jesus says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the fellowship we are part of, isn't it? No wonder they said, I'm joining. I'm joining that. That's incredible. I don't want to miss out on that. And hopefully that's stirring your heart, isn't it? The life of Jesus is stronger than family ties, isn't it? If you have family who are not Christians, I'm sure you felt sometimes, isn't it? I feel closer with other Christians than even them. Why? Because there's something eternal. There's something that lasts forever at work in you, isn't it? And it's, it's amazing to stand shoulder to shoulder. Just pray that Jesus would open your eyes to see they're not, they're not another 80-year-old just sat there. There so you can share in the life of God. That's awesome, isn't it? Awesome thought. What fellowship. Teaching Jesus of Nazareth. Fellowship. Sharing in his life. Let's do the next one. The breaking of bread. This isn't just communion, as in we'll eat bread and have a bit of juice or wine together. Later on here, isn't it? It says they broke bread in each other's homes. They ate in each other's homes. So I think it's wider than that. I think it's this. Hospitality. In order to break your bread with someone, 
you have to be willing to make room for them in your heart, don't you? Because what you're doing, you're sharing what you have with them. That's, that's the offer, isn't it? We sort of forget that when someone invites us around, isn't it? We're like, oh, food, amazing, this is great. We forget is that they've, they've gone to a lot of effort. Perhaps they've struggled with us in the past, I don't know. And they've, they've said, oh, I'd, I'd love to have you over. What's happened is this, isn't it? They've had to make room. Before they've had to make room for you around their table, they've had to make room for you in their heart. And what they're doing is they're saying, hey, come over. We'd love to share what we have with you. And it's amazing, isn't it? When we get together as Christians, I know the men felt it yesterday. You know, as we shared, it wasn't, well, there was some bread. But there was lots of other meaty bits as well, wasn't there? And veggie bits. Go remember that. But it was, it was amazing just to see making room for each other in our hearts. Hospitality, isn't it? What does Jesus do at the communion table? Isn't he doing exactly that? As the bread is handed out, he's offering you a piece of himself, isn't he? He's making room at the table for you. He's saying, I know you've sinned. I know you've failed this week. I know you feel lonely. I know you feel dark. I know, you, I know you're tempted terribly. I know you're in pain. I know you're in agony. I know you're worried about the future. I know you feel dark. I know all these things. And yet he says, there's room here for you. I'd love to share some of me with you. That's what Jesus is doing at the communion table, isn't it? It's meant to feed us. There's a piece of me, Jesus says, for you, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. And if you're not a Christian this morning, that's what Jesus is offering you, forgiveness and life and help and everything you need. Breaking the bread. He says, this is my body. Literally, this is me. And it has broken me to be able to share with you. But I'm so willing to do it. There's room for you in my heart. There's room for you around my table. There's room for you forever. They devoted themselves to that breaking of bread, hospitality, eating together, sharing their lives together, sharing their time with each other. And what did they look like? They looked like God to the world looking on. That's what they looked like. Friendship, fellowship, hospitality. They were one, we're told in Acts 2. They were united. They were joined together. And, and because of that, they had love. They devoted themselves to breaking of bread, to that hospitality. They forgave each other. It wasn't they were perfect. It wasn't they didn't sin. It wasn't that they didn't annoy each other. But they forgave. They spoke. They put things right because they saw Jesus had died. And they had that room in their hearts for each other. And it took a lot to tear them apart. Becca's been working on some projects for the craft fair made out of pallet wood. Have you seen all these pallets that people put outside their houses? It seems like a great idea at the time, doesn't it? So we've been, whenever we see one in Barry lately, we've been like, if it says free on it, some people like to keep them, don't you see, like, do I take it or not? But the ones that say free, we've been saying, oh, okay, we'll have that pallet. Becca's like, you can break it up for me and put it together and I'll paint on it. Has anyone ever tried to break up one of those pallets? Man alive. They are hard work to tear apart. Some of them have nails really thick, and then they bend them over at the end, almost like they don't want it to come apart. It's not designed to come apart, is it? It's not meant to come apart. And there's me with my, probably, a, you know, you're all going to laugh. I've got the wrong tools, isn't it? My hammer and my chisel and all this stuff, trying to lever it apart. It won't come apart. And often the, the wood breaks before it comes apart. What a great picture of church, isn't it? You're not meant to come apart. You're not meant to split up and break up and come apart. Jesus joins us together and we've got to keep making room for each other in our hearts. But as we do that, you might think, oh, it's a lot sharing my life, being vulnerable, making room in my heart for other members, sharing our lives together. It is hard. It can be painful. It does go wrong. But what does it look like? It means we get every time we sit down together through those people, through those other church members who are preparing that meal or whatever it might be, when we break bread or eat biscuit or have a cake, what are, we, what are we reminded of as we see them saying, sit at my table and eat? We're reminded that God makes room for me. That's what you're meant to see every time there's hospitality. Jesus, is, Jesus has made room for me. I don't deserve that. That's an incredible thing. Then prayer. 
they just called on Jesus for the first time, hadn't they? They just truly prayed for the first time, not just saying words, but from their hearts, isn't it? They were cut to their hearts. We had a hand in Jesus' death. Our sins caused his death. It was me, like we did last week. And they prayed. They prayed from their hearts. They were cut to their hearts. They were forgiven. And God answered them. They were saved. They received the Holy Spirit. And that's what a, a relationship is, isn't it? If you ever go to a restaurant and you see a, I don't know, a husband and a wife, and they're sat... Oh, I'll pick on my grandparents. My grandparents used to get their deck chairs out of the boot of the car and sit miles apart. I don't know why they did that, but you know, being a young boy, you always ask, don't you? Why do granny and granddad sit apart? Is there something wrong? Have they had a fight? Have they had an argument? No, that's just what they did. But looking on, you'd think there was something wrong, wouldn't you? You think, well, oh. and maybe those who are a bit older, you understand, I don't know. But that's, that's what they did. You think, if they're not communicating, if there's not words being said, if there's not emotions and feelings between them, you think there's something wrong. A good relationship, now they did have an amazing relationship, so I still don't understand why they did that. But they had an amazing relationship. Lots of words, communication, looks, emotions. That's what prayer's meant to be, isn't it? And prayer can be hard work sometimes. Sometimes we're empty, sometimes we don't know what to say. And last night, down at the nap, Jesus spoke to me about this one through a very odd way, so please bear with me. Um, before last night, me and Becca, we often go for a walk down the nap after tea, and we'd seen this little baby seagull, and he was limping, like that, just limping along. He looked in pain, you know, if you've had a limp, you know. We're going to call him Stephen, because Danny won a, a teddy seagull. And it was called Stephen Seagal. Seagal, Seagal. It's a bad pun. But it just reminded me of this little teddy that Danny's got, which limps. So it's still limping. And then when I went there last night, the seagulls were there again. And there was Stephen, still limping. I was like, oh, bless him. Love him. Limping along. But he was sort of confined to the grass, wasn't he? He was like, if he could, isn't he? Sort of stopping, leaning up. My leg hurts. You, you know, you sort of feel pity. You start imagine how they feel. Or maybe not, just me. But anyway, I was just really focusing on this seagull. And you know when God is trying to speak to you, it's like everything else goes. And that's all I could see. And I, I was like, I don't know. What is this about, Lord? I don't know. As I went down to the end of the nap, and there's that green hill, isn't there? I saw something that was so different. There was a bird of prey. I've not seen one of those down there. And it was really stormy last night, wasn't it? But this bird of prey was just hovering, completely still. I thought it was a, like a kite or, you know, one of those ones they have down the bowling green to stop the birds pecking at the lawn. Because it was just so perfectly still. And it was just hovering. And again, it happened, that moment, just like everything else went. I was just staring at this bird. And then all of a sudden, it just, with a quick flick of its wings, just, I don't know how fast it was flying, but it was diving everywhere. It was, it was soaring. And then it clicked. That's the difference, isn't it, between a church that prays and a church that doesn't pray. A Christian that prays and a Christian that doesn't pray. How often are we content like Stephen, isn't it? So I can do it. I, I've got this one. And we're, all the time we're limping, isn't it? Remember Jacob? He had a limp for the rest of his life to remember how much he needed Jesus. Remember during Elijah's time, he said, how long are you going to limp between two opinions? Either the Lord is God, Jesus is God, and serve him, or someone else is and pray to them. But make up your mind, stop limping. And how often do we let it all load up on us, isn't it? And it's almost like we're injured, we're bowed down under the weight, it's too heavy, we try and deal with it. It's all right, I've got this one, and we're limping along. And then how often have you remembered, isn't it? I can call on my Heavenly Father. And you start to pray. And what happens? You get powered by a different power. That's what happens, isn't it? That's what ha Stephen was under his own steam, wasn't he? Limping along. This bird of prey was, it was powered by a completely different, it had wind power. It was soaring. It wasn't, he did, hardly had to do anything. He, he was just driven along by the wind and by this incredible power. And he could fly wherever he wanted. He soared. Who knows the possibilities 
that this church could know, that you could know if, if we devote ourselves to praying, isn't it? Crying on Jesus, you'll start to be powered by something else, not you, but the power of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? The sky's not even the limit. There is no limit to Jesus' power, is there? He's filled with the Spirit beyond measure. Who knows what could happen? And I know we've all had experiences, isn't it, where we've prayed, where we've called on Jesus in prayer week, and he's given an amazing answer, and then we sort of stop and we grow cold in our praying. The church devoted themselves to prayer. What an amazing thing, and a picture of prayer, isn't it, that you can take off, you can start to soar, and you're driven along by Jesus, and he gives you the power and the strength you need, and you don't have to rely on yourself. There's unlimited help, unlimited power. Jesus himself cried and groaned with loud cries and tears, didn't he? And he was heard because of his reverent submission. No wonder they devoted themselves to pray because they could see what would happen if Jesus took hold of them. It's a challenge, isn't it? But they devoted themselves, the apostles' teaching, Jesus of Nazareth, the fellowship to share in the life of God together, Breaking bread, which did include communion, but seeing that God makes space for you and we make space for everyone else in our hearts. And prayer, they started to soar. And what happened, there was a sense of awe that fell on everyone around them. You can read about that in many, many books. Scottish revivals, Duncan Campbell's one. He says, you've met God on the moorland. You've met him in the homes. You've met him in the church. It seemed like God was everywhere. That's what happened. This sense of awe, this sense of this is real. Jesus is alive. God is real. And that's what we pray for whoever did the sign outside, isn't it? That all would fall on them. This God that I hate at the moment, he's real. And I need to get to know him. I need him to forgive me. And Jesus added people to the church every day. Now, we can't force that, can we? We could pay people to come, can't we? If we really wanted, we could say that. I'll give you, give you, give you a grand every time you come to church. People would come to church, wouldn't they? But it wouldn't be what Jesus wanted it to be. But Jesus was adding to the church every day. We've had people added and baptized this year, isn't it? Which is incredible. How exciting is it? There's now people sharing in the life of Jesus with us who look like him and remind us of him wherever we go together. But we need to look to Jesus to add and keep on adding. And every time, it's like a fire, isn't it? Another coal is added to the fire. The fire burns brighter. There's more devotion. Then another coal is added, and the fire burns hotter and brighter. So we could say, you must do this. But much better, isn't it, to say, Jesus has done this. How could I not devote myself to that, to him? So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the devotion to you we, we can see in Acts and the results. Lord Jesus, we just pray as a church, you would help us to have this devotion, not forced. But Lord, please work your wonders in our hearts so that we would be moved, more moved to devote ourselves Lord, so we can share in your life in a richer, deeper way as a church all the time. For your glory's sake we ask. Amen. We're going to do something slightly different to finish. It's a bit of a throwback to lockdown. We're going to sing our last song from a video um, that uh, Adrian prepared for us in lockdown. But because of the song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, it's talking about when we look at Jesus' love we realize his love demands our all. So let's just, as we sing this together, let's pray that, isn't it, that Jesus would give us that devotion. <coughs>
Amen. Yeah, I just echo what Matt says there. Devotion, devotion will never be forced. It is going to come from, as Matt says, a place of love. It's going to come from a place of wonder in God. You're just going to be so overwhelmed by his love and amazement that it's just going to bring out a, a great devotion in you. Um, so let's just raise our hands. We love to end with a verse here. So let's just raise our hands. And let, as we raise our hands, just let God touch your heart. As he touches your heart, it will just open up those doors. So let's raise them together. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. God bless you and amen.